The Senator from West Virginia. Mr. President, first of all, I'd like to congratulate all of the speakers. It's been wonderful hearing all my colleagues on both sides of the aisle state their positions. They've done it so eloquently. And uh, we've all learned a lot. And uh, I'm not sure it's changed anything, but we sure have learned a lot in this process. But I rise today to rebut what I, uh, what I believe is a grave misleading of the American people. Uh, before I get into the details, let me tell you a little bit about uh, where I come from in my political background. I've been involved in public service in my state of West Virginia for over 40 years in one capacity or another. I've been in the House of Delegates. I've been in the State Senate for 10 years. I've been Secretary of State. I've been Governor for two terms. And now I've been here in the Senate for going on 11 years. Um, uh, when I served in the legislature, uh, uh, I could put a bill on the floor and, uh, or I could put a bill in committee and it would get, go through committee. It would go to the floor if it came out. Uh, I could get amendments on it. Sometimes it passed, sometimes it didn't. But at the end of the day, we had a place we called junior rules. It was behind the Senate chamber. You go behind the doors right here, it would be junior rules. After it was over, after we had our debates, discussions, whether it be in committee or whether it be on the floor, we would all gather, Democrats and Republicans. We ate together. We had some refreshments together. We spoke about what happened today and what we could do to make it better tomorrow. I never could understand when I got here how divided we were. How did this happen? So I kept thinking. When I first got here, they said, um, well, you know, the Republicans are over there and we're the Democrats here. And uh, it's nice we all get along and everything. But now when they run, we've got to be against them. I got to be against you, no matter how close you may be, no matter if I sit beside you, no matter if we have dinner at night. If it's your up and cycle, I got to be against you. Not only that, am I supposed to be against you? I'm supposed to basically write a check to whoever's running against you, to whoever's running against you. And maybe even they'd want me to maybe go to your state and campaign against you. And I'm thinking, you know something? Where I come from in West Virginia, if I went to work during the day, and you did that to me, we're going to go outside and have a little conversation. That ain't going to happen back where I come from. And I wasn't going to do it here. Now, if we can change some things, that's what we should be changing. Why should we do this? How, how are we expected to sit down at the end of the day or the end of a session or end of anything and come back on Monday and says, okay, now, Senator Thune, would you, would you, would you go on this amendment with me and help me with this bill? After I just came out and basically work for your opponent, who the Democrats have recruited, uh, and basically give them money. That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So I keep thinking, we keep thinking, what's wrong with the place? That's what's wrong. I tried to get just a little oath that we could all sign that we wouldn't do that to each other. I guess there used to be a, a, a gentleman and ladies agreement. You just didn't do those things, but not anymore. Not anymore. I heard when the good old days, okay? I don't know what happened to the good old days, but I can tell you they're not here now. Um, we can talk about a lot of things and the way we want to change, and, but I still really believe that we should be talking how we treat each other and how we approach each other and in a body that's 330 million people are depending upon. Uh, but rules, what little bit we have left, uh, that maybe makes us take pause before we jump off of that bridge. We better be careful what we're doing. After the state legislature also had the privilege to serve as West Virginia Secretary of State. I never one time as Secretary of State in my official capacity had anyone ever talk to me. We've got to suppress the vote. Democrat, Republican, Independent, no matter what. No one ever came and said, Joe, we've got to stop this group from voting because that won't help us. No one ever thought that way. You know where most of my ideas came? I, I brought in early voting. I had a lot of men working in the mines, shift working and all that. And sometimes on Tuesdays, on our, our, our election day, they couldn't get off. They had to work. So someone says, well, you know what we did in our state? We gave early voting. We call it no excuse voting. You can come anytime you want. You got seven days, ten days, two weekends. We did whatever. So I had a hard time getting people to understand. They think, oh, maybe something bad is going to happen. Something nefarious will happen. It took a while for me to get seven days in. Just one weekend. Fought for that. After I got seven days, they wanted more. I understand that Kentucky just has early voting, uh, and that's, that's great. They make those decisions. That came out of the experiment that we call the great experiment, state by state. There's 50 experiments that go on every day in every state. 
we should learn from them. They should learn from us. We all share together. We've got many former governors sitting here. We know how this works. And that's what we're talking about. Um, I also started a program calling say, uh, Shares. It was a shares program. I had low turnout in West Virginia, and I was trying to get the turnout up. So I'm thinking, what can I do? And I always thought this. I can't sometimes teach an old dog new tricks, but I can teach a pup some tricks that maybe get the old dog to follow them. So I called a program called Share, Saving History and Reaching Every Student. Saving History and Reaching Every Student. Because Jennings Randolph, former Senator Jennings Randolph from West Virginia, was the father of the 18-year-old vote. It took him 21 years to get it done. Started back in World War II, didn't get it done until 70, 1970. He was the father. So I had the Jennings Randolph Award. I had every high school competing for it because we went out and educated the students. If you're 17 years of age and you turn 18 on election day or before, on a general election day or before, you can vote in a, in a primary election at 17 years of age. No one knew that. Kids didn't know that. We got them all fired up. And I'm going to tell you, we have awards and made big ceremonies. And all of our election counts went up. Everything went up. Did a good job. And they really, really appreciate it. So we were able to increase the turnouts. But I believe with every fiber in my body that every eligible citizen of voting age should have the right to vote and be protected by law. Everyone. And I think everyone in here believes the same thing. I truly do. That we should be able to do that. Later today, we're going to vote. Now I'm going to vote again to protect that right. And I'm going to be proud to co-sponsor of the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Amendment Act. We all have different positions on that, but I'm proud to be part of that. Uh, but that's not what we're debating right now. I think we all know that. Right now we're debating a fundamental change in the Senate rules that will forever alter the way this body functions. For the last year, my Democratic colleagues have taken to the Senate floor cable news airwaves, pages of newspapers across the country, uh, and to argue that repealing the filibuster is actually restoring the Senate to the vision of the founding fathers intended for this deliberate body. My friends, that is simply not true. It's just not true. The United States Senate has never in 233 years been able to end debate on legislation with a simple majority vote. With a simple majority vote, have never been able to end, end debate could not stop a debate. Robert Byrd used to say two things a senator can do. A senator has a right to amend and a right to speak. He always said that. In fact, prior to 1917, there was no mechanism for any debate in the Senate whatsoever. Couldn't end it. In that year, the Senate adopted a cloture rule. It required that the debate to end when two-thirds of the voting senators willed it. Since then, the cloture rule has been amended seven times, always by regular order. I hear all these things we're talking about, but we forget. A lot of the things are done with regular order. Just recently, Senator Schumer, Senator McConnell, basically this, the uh, debt ceiling. They did that using the rules. You didn't break the rules to do that. You did it. You worked it out, which is the leadership's responsibility. It means that the Senate has followed its own rule book when making changes that affect legislative debate. We've changed rules over, we've all talked about how many times rules have been changed. We've changed them, but we've changed them with the rules. We didn't break the rules to change the rules. But all of a sudden now, we just can't do it anymore. Just got to blow it up. The rule book means that the rules changes are done on the basis of broad bipartisan consensus, not imposed on the minority by raw majority power, no matter who's in power. The majority does not have that power to do that in this Senate. Now my colleagues propose to sidestep this process. They would use the nuclear option to override a rule that we have used ourselves, but now seem to find unacceptable. Unacceptable now. We're going to break the rules to change the rules. We're going to make up new rules as we go along, invite them ourselves to future majorities to disregard the rule book at will. No rule of the Senate can withstand the act of a willful majority. No will, no rule will stand the willful majority, not the cloture rule, nor any other rule. Let this change happen in this way, and the Senate will be a body without rules. There will not be no rules. The Senate's greatest rule is the one that is unwritten. This is an unwritten rule, and it's the greatest one we have. It's the rule of self-restraint. 
which we have very little of anymore, self-restraint. The rule will be broken along with the cloture rule if the nuclear option is executed, and for that I cannot be a party to that. But there's good news. Here's the good news. We don't have to change the rules to make our case to the American people about voting rights, about the John Lewis. We don't have to. We really don't. Senator Schumer didn't have to file cloture to cut off debate. He didn't have to fill the amendment tree to block Republican amendments. We're here. Uh, we could have kept voting rights legislation as a pending business for the Senate. Today, next week, a month from now, this is important. Let's work it out. Let's see, stay here and go at it. I think you all are here. Everybody's here. Had a lot of good talks today. I'm sure you have a lot of amendments you'd like to make, and all of us would like to make amendments. We want to see it work again. Let's do it. Let's go for it. That's exactly what I think should be done. I think the American people really need that. I think that we owe that to them. We've wasted a year behind the scenes, partisan negotiations, back and forth, talking through each other, around each other, but not to each other. Let's have the debate with Democrats and Republicans and let the American people decide. The pressure will come. That's what filibusters were about. The pressure mounted until you made either a compromise, you made a uh, decision, you all decided to go. It's, it's, it's an you know, one way or another, you were going to end that, that uh, filibuster. And today we haven't seen that. Just four years ago, 61 of us, 61 senators, myself being one, 33 of us on the Democrat side, many of which are sitting in the chamber today. You've heard this many times. We sent a letter to Senator Schumer and to Senator McConnell warning them of the dangers of eliminating the filibuster. That letter presented a united front committed to preserve the ability of the members to engage in extended debate when bills are on the Senate floor, while some of the senators have changed their positions. Um, I have not. Uh, I respect uh, that this is a two-way street, and I would hope you would respect where I am. I respect that you have changed your position on this. I would hope that you would respect that I have not, and I have never wavered on this. I do not and will not attack the contents of the character of anybody who's changed their position. And I would hope you would give me the same opportunity and not attack mine. Uh, allowing one party to exert complete control in the Senate with only a simple majority will only pour fuel on a fire political whiplash and dysfunction that is tearing this nation apart. And you don't have to look very far to see how we're tearing ourselves apart. I can tell you, every part of this country, people are divided now. It used to be that we couldn't talk about religion at the, at the supper table. Now you can't talk about politics. It's truly become a blood sport, and it should not be that way. The rest of the world's looking at us. They're depending on us. They're looking for guidance. They're looking for some stability. Uh, if we do this, there's not going to be any check on the executive branch. Bob Byrd was scared to death of not having a check on the executive branch. Even when the executive branch was part of his own party being a Democrat, he always said, I do not work for the president. I work for the people of West Virginia. And he made very sure of that. And he made sure that every president knew that. And he made sure he hold them accountable. And they weren't going to steamroll over him. The filibuster plays an important role in stabilizing our democracy from the transitory passions of the majority and respecting the input of the minority in the Senate. Contrary to what some have said, protecting the role of the minority, Democrat or Republican, has protected us from the volatile political swings that we have endured over the last 233 years. The role of the minority is what ensures the policies of our nation have input from all corners of the country. We must never forget this is a Senate made up of 50 states, 100 senators, blue states and red states. For those who believe that bipartisanship is impossible, we have proven them wrong. In the last several years, we have made historic investments in our nation's public lands, passed trillions of dollars in COVID-19 relief, and finally invested in rebuilding our nation's infrastructure. These critical pieces of legislation have had significant impacts on Americans across the country. They were passed with broad bipartisan support. We can do it again. We truly can. We can make it easier to vote. We must. We can make it harder to cheat. I think we can. We've heard from our Republican colleagues who basically agree with us on that. We can reform the Electoral Count Act, which is what caused the insurrection. We agree on that. We can fix that. 
We never witnessed, so we'll never have to witness another January 6th. It was such an absolutely deplorable stain on this great country of ours. And we can protect local election officials from harassment and intimidation by making them federal crimes. We can do that. And I know we can do that together. I'm going to leave you with this. In May 2010, just a month before Senator Robert C. Byrd died, he died in June of 2010. This is a month before. Senator uh, Byrd was asked by then Chairman uh, Senator Chuck Schumer of the Rules Committee, I believe at that time, uh, to testify about the filibuster before the Senate Rules Committee because of his unsurpassed knowledge on this, on this subject. And Senator Capito knew him well, too. And she knows how he would pontificate at times with us. Uh, but he would say, Senator Burr began by quoting James Madison. He said, Madison said that the purpose of the Senate was first to protect the people against the rulers. Secondly, to protect the people against the transient impressions into which they themselves may be led. And that the Senate serves as a necessary fence against such dangers. Senator Byrd testified that the right to filibuster anchors this necessary fence. He concluded with, we must never, ever, ever, ever tear down the only wall, the necessary fence that this nation has against the excesses of the executive branch and the resultant haste and tyranny of the majority. Eliminating the filibuster would be the easy way out. It wasn't meant to be easy. I cannot support such a perilous course for this nation when elected leaders are sent to Washington to unite our country, not to divide our country. We're called the United States, not the divided states. And putting politics and party aside is what we're supposed to do. It's time that we do the hard work to forge a difficult compromises that can stand the test of time. And that's what we're here. 233 years. Think about it. Wars, depressions. Think of all the hardships this country's gone through. All the people that have suffered and fought for every right we have. We're not going backwards. But with that being said, we can do better than what we're doing today. We truly can. We must promise the Americans for a brighter future. I think we can do that together. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor.